Hello there friends and welcome for today's BG3 guide we have at last a shapeshifter druid circle of the moon build. This character will get to change into all sorts of different animals and also elemental shapes for great benefit during combat as each form has its own unique abilities. From lots of damage with multiple attacks per turn around 9 total Fun stuff such as area of effect attacks, knockdown for free on every hit, and even infinite invisibility that can be spammed at will. And of course, since you get your wild shape as early as the second level, you'll be great even early on. But the more levels you have, the stronger your forms will become. Lastly, as a druid you are still a full spellcaster, so you'll also be able to provide enough spell support to your party when it comes to healing spells, summons and also buffs, with decent enough tanking capabilities as well, because you'll always restore full hit points upon changing into wild shape, and even revert back to human form if you reach zero. So without further ado, let us get into our Circle of the Moon Wild Shape Shifter Druid build. First, I want to cover some of the main mechanics behind Wild Shape, but all my guards are timed, so you can just skip to the build section now if you prefer. The first and most important mechanic is that Wild Shape, just like Polymorph from Dungeons & Dragons 3rd edition, will automatically set all of your physical scores, that's strength, dexterity and constitution, to that of the form, as each form has their own physical scores. Let's choose the Smilodon, for example. And there we go, our stats got replaced, and this doesn't matter if they were bigger or lower to begin with, they'll just be set to whatever the form has. Meanwhile, your mental scores will all remain the same. Wild shapes also cost a wild shape charge, you start with two of them and they are fully restored upon a short rest. Now, all of the forms also have a base amount of hit points, that is usually further enhanced with druid class levels, although it doesn't work for some of them, like the Raven, for example, or the Cat. Meanwhile, for others like the Owlbear, you also get bonus hit points based on your Druid class levels. So despite the Owlbear base being 65, by virtue of being a maxed out Druid, we have way more. Second, and also very important, in BG3, there's pretty much almost no gear that actually transfers to wild shape when it comes to, of course, the most important benefits and properties. As a matter of fact, you just don't get anything at all. For example, I have the Hell Dusk, Helmet, it doesn't work, Shade Slayer Cloak, nope. The same for rings and talismans. Usually, gear that transfers to wild shape will have it stated outright in the description. For example, the Shape Shifter's Boon Ring, and also the armor of moon basking. I honestly don't think there's any other gear in the game at all that transfers to wild shape. At least not as far as having a good benefit. It's just the way it is, sadly. I'm not sure why they decided to nerf it this way. In a game like Pathfinder, pretty much the best gear benefits transfer to wild shape and polymorph. Outside, of course, of stuff like the armor bonus to armor class and so on. But not in BG3. This also means that usually it's going to be quite hard to achieve a very high amount of AC under wild shape outside of the elemental myrmidon forms later on. However, wild shapes can be quite tanky for another reason. While they don't have high AC, whenever your character gets downed, that is reduced to zero hit points under wild shape, you'll simply revert back to human form with leftover damage from the last strike you took under Wild Shape. Also, whenever your character is injured, even in human form, if you Wild Shape, you'll then restore all of your hit points. While Druids, for example, are full spellcasters with access to the max spell level in the game, under Wild Shape, you will not be able to cast spells at all. Therefore, it's better to focus on spells that either summon creatures or that directly apply buffs to your character, such as the classic Bark skin for higher AC in Wild Shape. As both of these spell types, buffs and summons, will persist through Wild Shape. Wild Shape will also block quite a lot of other actions. 
for example fighter's action surge, but you can amusingly enough still drink potions under its effect. Well alright, now that we know the main mechanics behind Wild Shape, let's at last get into our build. Later I'll also cover the best items and the best Wild Shape forms. Now for race you can truly go with anything you want, and I already have a best races guide you can check to the side here where I cover everything in depth. Something fun is Githyanki as usual, for its very useful astral knowledge ability, but anything goes. For class you have to be a druid unfortunately, I'm not sure why, but unlike other D&D CRPGs, in BG3 there's no polymorph spells and so on, so if you want to change into a different form you're kind of stuck being a druid, which I find disappointing. But druids are still a very solid and powerful class in this game. It's just that I wish other classes could also change their shape. When it comes to your stats, as I've explained before, Wild Shape will set all of your physical scores to that of the forms. Which means, at the very least as far as strength, well, you can easily dump it. The same for Charisma. Now, there is something to be said about starting with decent enough dexterity in constitution scores, even as a shifter druid, because, once again, as I've also already explained, if you get reduced to zero hit points under Wild Shape, you'll swap back to human form. If you have decent enough dexterity like 14 for maximum medium armor bonuses, and also constitution, you'll have higher AC and hit points, which means you'll be tankier when you need it the most, as to ensure your character survives even if you go into human form. 15 constitution is more than enough, so add a plus 1 to it, we'll get 16 from a feat later on. Now as far as wisdom, it's not really needed for this build at all, unless you want to go with the monk multiclass, which, as I'll explain later, is not really necessary. If you want to go with monk, then max wisdom out at 17. Otherwise, honestly, 14 is more than enough, or 16 even. Because the reality is, you'll still be able to cast all the spells you want, even with low wisdom, but this can help with some dialogue checks. The same for Charisma, so you can actually spend the remaining points into it, assuming you want this character to be, let's say, your party face. And as far as the plus one to any stat you can get at chapter one, well, it's going to depend. Wisdom, of course, if you go with Monk. Otherwise, Strength and Dexterity can both work because some of the forms have uneven scores and the plus one will help set them to an even score instead. And as far as cantrips and spells, I also have a best spells guide you can check to the side here. So for now, let's keep it simple. Guidance, of course, is a must have. And the second one is up to you, might as well go with Shilele. Or skills and backgrounds, honestly, if you have decent enough wisdom or charisma, you might as well go with one of the dialogue checks, like persuasion, and also perception or insight, and pick a background that further enhances one of these skills. At the second level you gain your wild shapes, and of course, for our subclass, we absolutely want the Circle of the Moon Druid, the best at shape-shifting. While you can't cast spells under Wild Shape, through the exclusive Lunar Man ability, you'll be able to expand spell slots as a bonus action to restore your hit points, even under Wild Shape. Second, changing your form itself also costs a bonus action instead of a normal one, which is great for doing it during battle, while still retaining the ability to attack. Now, right at level 3, because we already have access to our initial wild shapes, you can actually multi-class with the classic Monk, because as always, just like 3rd edition D&D, the extra bonus you get from Wisdom will work to further enhance your wild shape AC. I just don't think this is necessary, because, well, first, you can just cast the Mage Armor spell for a similar benefit, as they won't stack, the same for the bark skin spell for the shapes that have lower AC. Also, for some strange reason, I'm pretty sure they nerfed this interaction in the game because, well, for some reason, I was always getting stuck with a minus debuff to AC under wild shape, even with maximum wisdom, as you can see here. So honestly, I don't think it's that necessary. I'd much rather remain a pure druid for most of the game for faster access to the best wild shape forms and also 
the extra attacks you get per action. The sooner you can get all of that, the better for you. At level 4 Druid we have our first feat, and honestly, there's only one option here. Tavern Brawler, always. You can increase your constitution by 1, which is why we started with 15, but most importantly, all of your unarmed attacks under wild shape, that is the form snatcher attacks like bites and so on, will have double your strength modifier added to attack rolls, which of course pretty much ensures you always hit enemies. After all, forms like the Owl Bear or the Smilodon have very high strength. Sadly, it doesn't really work as far as extra damage, unlike, let's say, Monk unarmed attacks. Do note that, as far as the elemental forms, only the Earth Elemental Myrmidon has unarmed attacks, the other ones carry weapons, which means they will not benefit from Tavern Brawler. All the animal shapes, however, will. At level 5 Druid you have the very powerful Wild Strike, which is well essentially an extra attack you can perform under Wild Shape. Just like the normal extra attack some classes get at level up. And remember, this extra attack is applied per action you have. At level 6 you have the Primal Strike ability, so that your attacks will count as magical for overcoming resistance and immunity to no magical damage, also quite good. At level 8 it's time to get another feat, and to me the best choice here is definitely the classic Alert. For the huge plus 5 bonus to initiative and immunity to surprised attacks. The main reason I recommend going with this is, well, as I've explained in all my other guides, having high initiative is paramount to ensuring you always attack first and easily defeat any enemy, even on tactician mode, but most importantly, because you cannot rely on your actual dexterity score under Wild Shape, right? Some of the forms have pretty low dexterity. With Alert, at the very least, you almost always attack first before enemies, thus bypassing this annoying limitation. Level 10 is also huge for Druids because it's when you get the last extra attack through improved Wild Strike. Now you can attack 3 entire times per each individual action, which can go up to around 9 whole attacks under Wild Shape, just like a fighter. So in a way, amusingly enough, Druids are the only class that have 3 attacks per action besides the classic fighter. Because of how powerful having all of these extra attacks is, I would only multi-class your characters starting from level 11. But honestly, I don't think it's necessary at all, because a lot of the class unique abilities won't work under Wild Shape. There's Monk, as I said earlier. Rogue can help with 3 levels for the extra bonus action when it comes to certain forms, like the Hour Bear that can attack as a bonus action. Wizard can provide you with access to almost all of the spells in the game, after all you are still a full spellcaster as a druid. Great for some extra buffs, like Mirror Image. Fighter has Action Surge at the second level, but... It won't work under Wild Shape, you have to use it before shifting into a form, which I find a bit annoying. Anyways, I'd much rather keep my character a pure druid. And while you can truly go with whatever you want as the last feat, just remember a lot of stuff here will not work under wild shapes, such as for example, Lucky, even tough, although you can still increase your hit points under human form for extra tanking, assuming you get down under wild shape of course. And you can always increase a mental ability score. With both our build and also the main wild shape mechanics out of the way, let's now dive into what the best wild shape forms actually are, including their most powerful and special abilities. And right at the second level, you'll already acquire your first wild shape forms. You'll start with Badger, Spider, Wolf, Cat, and Circle of the Moon also has the Bear. The best forms here are certainly the Wolf, Spider, and also the Bear. The Bear definitely has the highest hit points of the early forms, but it also has the worst dexterity possible, which means you'll always act later because of low initiative, and you'll also have quite low armor class that can be further enhanced through the Bark Skin spell, which you can cast on yourself of course as a druid. The bear's main unique ability, Golden Roar, is also rather disappointing, especially because like I said, the bear doesn't really have the best AC. 
Now my preferred pick for the earlier forms is definitely the wolf. The wolf doesn't have that high hit points, but decent enough dexterity, higher armor class than the bear, and most importantly, a very unique passive called Pack Tactics, which means all of your wolf attacks will have advantage against enemies so long as there's an ally nearby. Very easy to do because, well, you are a melee character as a wolf. And I don't think it needs any saying how powerful having free advantage is in a game like BG3, for both increasing the chances of you hitting the enemy and getting critical hits. Speaking about criticals, the wolf is also good for that, because of its unique Exposing Bite ability. Whenever you hit the enemy with this, the next attack against the same target will be an automatic critical hit. Sadly, it's only once per short rest. Besides that, you also have the Inciting Howl ability, which can increase the movement of all allies. I wouldn't really bother using this unless for pre-buffing purposes, because it does cost an action. At level 4, you'll get more forms, the classic Underdark Cow, and also the Dire Raven. Our bovine friend, its charging ability can be quite useful for dealing damage to multiple enemies and knocking them down while also having higher hit points than Wolf, but also awful dexterity. Just like the bear. Great strength, however. Level 6 is when things start getting really good, because it's when you get access to two of the most powerful forms, the panther and also the owl bear. Let us start with the panther form. It has one of the most overpowered wild shape abilities in the whole game. Prowl which, well, is basically infinite use invisibility. It only costs one action, but you can spam this as many times as you want, so long as you have actions remaining. Does require concentration and, well, makes you invisible, which has amazing synergy with both dealing damage to enemies. As a matter of fact, while under Prowl, your first attack even deals increased damage, will also ambush and surprise enemies, and most importantly, is amazing for extra defenses, because so long as you have more than one action available per turn, for example from the haste spell and also the elixir of bloodlust, that's three actions already, you can always go invisible, attack the enemy, then go invisible right after. Enemies in BG3 have a really hard time detecting invisible characters, even if some manage to detect you, usually you can just force combat right as they detect you to even ambush them from stealth. It's kinda crazy. The Panther also has other nice benefits, for example, a pounce ability that can knock enemies down, and also a juggler strike for higher damage against knockdown enemies. So it's not just about stealth spamage. Definitely one of the best farms in the whole game because of how unique your infinite invisibility is. The Owl Bear form, on the other hand, is the first really big bruiser you have, that is, you'll hit for quite a lot of damage because it is the form that has the highest strength of them all, plus a great amount of hit points and even armor class, at least for Wild Shape. You have three uses of the Rage ability to further enhance your strength and damage, and also make nearby creatures fearful, together with a very unique jump called Crushing Flight. As a bonus action, you can leap at enemies as an area of effect to not only deal damage, but knock everything around you down. Quite powerful because once again, it's a bonus action, you still have your main attacks that not only deal damage, but can also push enemies back. Even an area of effect ability around you, just be careful not to hit allies. Level 8 is another huge power up for your druid shapeshifter, as this is when the Circle of the Moon gets the exclusive Smilodon form. The Sabertooth Tiger has very high strength, almost the same as Owlbear. Your AC and Dexterity aren't really the best, however you have some of the best offensive and also defensive capabilities as far as wild shape. First, the Shred Armor ability, which can be spammed at will, and will reduce the enemy's armor class by two whole points. It says one here, but it's actually two. 
There's no save or resistance against this whatsoever, but it will not stack with itself. Still, this is actually a massive reduction to the enemy's AC. After all, BG3 is a low numbers game, and will stack with other sources like the slow spell. Second, your default attack, a bite, not only deals damage, but also knocks the enemies down. Which you can then combine, just like the panther form, with another special ability that deals higher damage against prone enemies. Last but not least, it's also the only wild shape that you regenerate per turn. For quite a nice amount as well, 2 to 16 hit points. It's definitely a very cool looking and quite powerful form. Meanwhile, level 10 is when you get at last the ultimate wild shape forms. The elemental myrmidons. You also get to become a dinosaur, but it's nowhere near as good. First, all of the elemental forms cost two hold wild charges at once, instead of just one. But they're definitely worth it. The elementals all have decent AC, definitely way better than all of the animal forms. With great strength scores as well. But there's two that stand out. First we have the Earth Elemental Myrmidon. It has a unique ability that further enhances its AC by a plus 2. However, we reduce your movement speed, but who cares when you're just milling the enemies. And this doesn't cost anything, by the way, not even an action. And don't forget, the elementals, just like the elemental summons, can all teleport at will as a bonus action. Now, the most powerful benefit of the earth elemental is its normal attack, amusingly enough. Grounded Thunder Strike. Because it actually deals base damage here and then is further boosted by plus 3d10 extra thunder damage per strike. It says just 1d10 here, but it's actually triple that amount. I don't think there's any weapon or anything else in the game that deals as much extra damage as this. Second, you can even knock enemies down with this as well if they fail a saving throw. So quite stacked for just a normal attack. Second, we have the Water Myrmidon. Just like the Water Myrmidon Summon, you have one of the best area of effect damage abilities in the whole game called Explosive Icicle. While it is only once per turn, you'll fire three whole bolts of ice at all enemies in the area, each dealing 3 to 24 damage. Which means this can hit for even higher than 70 damage. And don't forget the Healing Vapors ability to restore the hit points of all nearby allies for a huge amount, while also applying the wet status effect on all targets, including enemies. And you might ask why? Well, because remember, the elemental's most powerful damage ability, Explosive Icicle, deals cold damage, which will be doubled if the enemy is wet. Super simple to do when you have multiple actions per turn, right? For loads and loads of area of effect damage, even single target as well, because it doesn't matter. And by the way, each of the icicles fired can also critical for higher damage. The other elementals just don't compare to earth or water. Alright, now let us cover gear for our wild shape shifter druid. Now as I explained before, 99% of gear benefits will not transfer to wild shape. Outside of the armor of moon basking, first to grant you a very nice temporary hit points shield, while even reducing damage from all sources by one, and last but not least, a plus two bonus to AC under wild shape, even advantage on saving throws against spells. And of course, note that it says right here, this effect persists while using your druidic wild shape ability. Lastly, we have the Shapeshifter Spoon Ring for some nice benefits under shapeshifting. When it comes to the other gear options, it's only going to matter when you are under human form, that is, once again, if you ever get killed under wild shape, so you swap back. Therefore, you should go with medium armors, because druids can equip them just fine. To ensure your character will remain alive until you can wild shape back into another form at the next turn. Shields can also help with that, including extra sources of AC like the Defender Flail. When it comes to ranged weapons, they don't really matter. There's always the Talisman of greater health for even higher hit points in human form, and the rest is really up to you. 
Don't forget that you absolutely want to acquire the Everlasting Vigor Potion from Asterion's quest at the second chapter in the Moonrise Tower, because this bonus will persist through Wild Shape, and it's the only way we have of increasing our form's strength even further. And of course, the Elixir of Bloodlust for even more actions. And remember, you have three entire attacks per each individual action. Well, alright friends, so this was it from my druid, Wild Shape Shifter build. If you found this guide useful, please remember to like and subscribe and also consider becoming a channel member if you can. I truly appreciate your support, thank you for watching and see you next time friends.